In this video, I am so excited to take you along as my husband and I are celebrating a really cozy date night in and I am sharing how I'm prepping for it, what I'm cooking for it, and how we actually spend the evening. The first thing I want to do is make some candles, hand dip them. And I have this block of beeswax that I've always been wanting something to do with. My husband's walking in the kitchen because I tried to chop some pieces off. And I'm explaining to him that this is actually really a lot of effort and I'm enlisting his help. He is, as you can see, a lot taller than I am and he has a bit more leverage. He also has really big hands. Um, we are debating whether this is the best knife or not. And I'm going to go get a cleaver, which I think will work a lot better than this smaller kitchen knife. Here it is, it has a bigger handle and a bigger blade and makes it a little bit easier to push down on it. There's no really easy way to get into beeswax. You can grate it, but that's a lot of effort too. And I find that asking him to help me to cut it in smaller pieces is just the perfect way to do it. Over here, I have a pot with hot boiling water. I'm gonna add the beeswax chunks to this really tall, narrow weck jar for which I will leave a link in the description box below, which is perfect for dipping. And I'm gonna set the pot over another burner because I want the one that is closer to me for my next activity here. While these are melting, I am making these melt in your mouth chocolate hearts. For that, I am breaking a chocolate bar into smaller pieces. And again, I'll leave the recipe in the description box for you if you're interested in how to make it. And to get that melt in your mouth quality, I'm adding coconut oil because that is exactly what it will do. It will give that melt in your mouth quality that you just don't get with regular dark chocolate. I'm putting all of that into a Pyrex glass measuring jar and setting that into another water bath. And then I'm going to add some more beeswax pellets because I want that glass jar to be a little bit fuller than I already have it to get taller candles. I'm using up a lot of the beeswax that I have. And here you can see that it's already melting. Now for these chocolate hearts, I have a silicone mold. And even though silicone is pretty much nonstick, I have found that adding a little bit of coconut oil to these individual molds makes the surface look nicer and the hearts to come out a little bit easier. I'm just gonna spread that into each of these little molds and hoping that I have enough chocolate for all of that. But in the past, that seemed to be the recipe that I needed. And just scrubbing a little bit, it's good for your hands as well. Now over here, my chocolate is pretty much melted. I'm giving it a quick stir to check for any remaining lumps, but I don't think I have any chunks in there because otherwise that would make it a little bit harder to fill these little chocolate molds. I also like to make sure that the bottom of my jar is dry because if it drips into the molds, chocolate and water don't like each other. And that's why I'm drying it off, even though I decided to not pour it in there, but use a small spoon to scoop some in there. And the reason I'm just filling the molds a little bit instead of all the way is because I want to add those roasted Hazelnuts, as you can see, they're the bag that I have sitting on the counter. And I have found that if I only add a little bit of chocolate first and then add the hazelnuts, then they don't actually poke through the surface and the surface will look really sweet and nice, which you will see in just a bit in this video. So filling all the little individual molds here and once I'm done, I will put them in the freezer for just a little bit until they're hardened. You can let them sit at room temperature, but this one will speed up the process. It's always 
challenge to find some room in our freezer, but here we go. And I want them to be pretty level and not at an angle. So we'll let those solidify. Here you can see that they are completely solid. And now I can add my hazelnuts. You don't have to use hazelnuts. You could use other nuts. I find that hazelnuts and chocolates are a great combination. You could use almonds, you could use walnuts. They might be a little big. You might have to break them up in chunks or I don't know, I don't peanuts, they could go or pistachios. Anyhow, so I'm adding the whole ones, not the half ones, because you get a bit of a mix of all of those in this bag. But it's a pretty good deal. And they're already roasted, which intensifies the flavor of the hazelnuts and just really brings out the nuttiness of the hazelnuts. Closing the bag, I don't know these Ziploc bags with a Ziploc in the middle it's, are not my favorite, but anyhow. Again, taking the melted chocolate out of the water bath, drying the bottom of my Pyrex measuring cup, and now I'm carefully adding more melted chocolate over these nuts here. I'm being careful. In the past, I've just sort of eyeballed and poured in there, but this time I want to be just a little bit more neat and orderly. And sometimes the hazelnuts want to move over to the side. I'm trying really to use my chocolate in a way that it pushes the hazelnuts that have moved over to the side a little bit more to the center. Um, you can call me a little bit, um, I don't know, anal maybe or too detail oriented, but it really depends on what you want to do. And I don't mind doing these things that take a little bit more effort because I actually enjoy that and I enjoy the end product and I wanted that to be a date night treat. This would also be perfect for Valentine's Day. They're little hearts and you can gift them in a box or you can put them on a little small plate. The possibilities are endless here. And now that the beeswax is pretty much melted, I'm just cutting some 100% cotton yarn. You can buy specific wick material, wick uh, threads, but I didn't have that. And I am just gonna use this cotton yarn here that works just as well. And carefully dipping it all the way into the bottom of my jar, letting the beeswax dry a little bit. And I wanna make two candles and that is why I am dipping the two sides, the two ends of my string here. And in just a little bit, you can see how I'm proceeding from here. It's a pretty meditative experience. And I have to say, I enjoy that because it is such a neat way to make your own hand dipped candles. It is definitely slow living. I could go to the store and buy some, but knowing that I made my own candles just fills me with pride and the sense of accomplishment and being able to do something. And, you know, if you have leftover beeswax, you can always melt it. And in a previous video, I showed you how I have little jars and make these little votive candles, but the tapers just look so much nicer. I'm just going to continue dipping them and pulling them out, letting them drop off and cool down a little bit so that the melted beeswax sticks to the cool beeswax. That's the whole key here to make these tapers get bigger. forward a little bit you can see here they have become a little bit wider but I have these pieces on the bottom those longer drops where the beeswax is dripping off of the tapers 
and I have some scissors here. I will just simply cut those off because they make it a little bit harder to put them in candle holders and just put them right back into the beeswax to remelt it. It's actually a really full way to do that. I'm just going to continue cutting that off if there's another piece here and then continue dipping them. They get a little bit wider so it's actually better to, well I can still dip them in at the same time. Moving them through the air to cool down the beeswax, that's the key. But it definitely is a slower process. And I think next time I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it in the evening. If I'm watching a show, I'll just set myself up on the couch and I can do this on the coffee table and just keep on dipping because like I said, it's a very meditative experience. And you can also get a little bit tired. So I'm hanging them here over my cabinet knobs. Now they're big enough that I don't want them to touch and I dip them individually, one after the other. That's, I guess, if you have a very tall, narrow jar to dip them in. But that's okay because as you can see, those tapers have gotten pretty thick at this point. You can always go more, of course, but I think I'm okay with these and I'm pretty happy with them. Then I will just cut off those little tippy points there and put the beeswax back into the jar. And I can always remelt and add more beeswax or remelt it and put it in little votives. Now I'm going to just cut the wick here and put them in these candle holders that I have chosen for them. I actually measured that they would be the perfect size for these and you can see the jar which has more beeswax in it for another time for more candles. Here they are, my candles. My chocolate hearts are completely solid and it's really fun to pop them out of the silicone molds and here they are, they came out perfect and my husband's lingering in the kitchen and asking when he can have them. And I said, no, 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 no. We, um, first of all, we want to show you, the audience, the people here watching this video, what they look like and also take you along on our date night. And he has a real sweet tooth. So I always have to make sure he's not eating whatever I'm making. I have another antique little saucer from my grandparents and I'm just going to arrange them on there. That looks so cute. These little melt in your mouth chocolate hearts. We did have them and I can tell you they were absolutely fantastic. I also wanted to make a real dessert instead of just the chocolate hearts and that is my avocado chocolate mousse. I love that because it is using natural ingredients instead of, I mean natural, yes, but it is using avocados instead of butter or cream and I kid you not, you cannot taste the avocado in the chocolate mousse. I just showed you how I like to get the avocado pits out of the avocados. And I'm using two avocados here, which is really the serving for four people, but it doesn't hurt to have any leftover for that sweet tooth husband that I have. And I'm scooping that into a Vitamix, which is really helpful for making this dessert. I am not sure if you can make it with an immersion blender. I haven't tried that, but a high speed blender is definitely helpful for making this dessert. I'm picking out some of these not so good pieces, but otherwise these avocados are just perfect. 
they're perfectly ripe. You want them ripe and not a little bit on the hard side. To that, I'm adding some melted coconut oil. Again, that just gives it a really decadent feeling in your mouth. Some milk and the chocolate powder, maple syrup. I need four tablespoons, but I'm just three tablespoons. And then some vanilla extract, my homemade one. With that, I'm gonna be a little bit more careful and a pinch of salt because salt always brings out the sweetness of all the desserts. Setting the Vitamix container on the base and giving that a whirl. You wanna go slow, you can also use that plunger if it's a little heavy. But here you can see it's completely smooth and velvety. And I'm gonna spoon it into these individual little ramekins. It is a pretty rich dessert, so that's why I'm okay just using smaller ramekins for an individual serving. And then I'll have some leftover, but that will not last long in our house. From the backyard, I picked some mint leaves and a raspberry and just looks really pretty. Now for our dinner, I'm making red beet pasta. For that, I'm cracking eggs into a bowl and whisk the eggs. You could also do this in a blender, but I just found that this is really easy. I'm also gonna link the recipe. The original recipe, I used fresh beets and steamed them and then I blended them. But for this one, I am experimenting with a beet powder and I think that's going to work really well. If you don't have fresh beets or if you want it a little bit faster and you don't want to have to steam the beets before you actually make this, you can just use the beet powder. Some salt makes it taste better. And for this one, I also measure. and. Now I'm just going to mix the beet powder with the eggs because if you were to mix the beet powder with the flour, it wouldn't really get very uniform and you would have these um, color variations is what I'm looking for. And I wanted the beet pasta to be pretty much a uniform color. It's actually very stunning and striking and it actually makes the perfect Valentine's dish because of the red color. But anytime you are looking for something a little bit different out of the ordinary, this is the perfect dish. I am whipping this and mixing it really well. I want all the bead powder to be completely incorporated into the whisked eggs until I have no more little clumps in there. Now I'm going to add flour and I need two cups, which in hindsight, I've never done this recipe before. So I was making it the first time here on camera, which is risky, but I thought I'll just wing it. Um, the recipe said to use two cups of flour. I found that my pasta dough got a little bit dry. What I'm doing here is I'm just adding a little bit. I'm adding half a cup of flour to my beet egg mixture and give that a good whirl and get that nicely incorporated. You can already see how beautiful the red color is and beets are super healthy too. I just love the sweet earthy flavor of the beets. You can taste that a little bit, but it's not super strong or you think you're actually eating beets. It's just really subtle, but that's really nice. I'm gonna add the rest of the flour here and mix that in. You will be able to see that the dough is a little bit dry and unwieldy. So the next time I'm gonna make this, I'm probably gonna start with a cup and a half of flour and 
then add just a little bit more depending on always the size of your eggs and the moisture content of the flour. It's always good to start with a little less and you can always add more. I could have added a little bit more water, but I am just using a fork here to mix it. And you will see in a moment because it is so dry that just with the fork alone, that's not gonna work so well. And I decided to turn the dough onto my counter, moving things away here, making some space so that I have enough room. And just gonna dump the whole dough onto the counter. It looks more pink than red at this point, which means that you see more flour than beet mixture. And I'm stripping the fork because that's the kind of stuff that if you put the fork in the dishwasher, it the dishwasher may not actually be able to clean the fork. Now using my hands, I am kneading the dough. And again, this is something that I actually really enjoy doing by hand slowly. And it's very tactile feeling the dough. And as I told you before, yes, I know that this dough is a little bit on the dry side, but here we go. This is already a lot better and I have some little crumbs here, but I will collect them in just a little bit. Makes nice red hands too. I have already attached my pasta machine to my counter and I'm cutting the dough into three pieces. And to move it through the pasta machine, I like to flatten the dough. Attaching the handle here. And on the widest setting, I'm gonna go through and pushing the dough through the pasta machine. You can see that the first go, the dough doesn't wanna stick together. It breaks into pieces and I don't worry about that because I will simply take those pieces and fold them and press them into one another and then just keep on moving them through the machine until they actually stick together. This is part of what the gluten does. It holds it together, it almost binds it, it gives it structure. And the more you manipulate the gluten, the stronger it will get. And that is one of the reasons why I like to move my dough pieces through the machine a few times. As you can see, I'm folding it in half, doubling it up and moving through again. Oftentimes when I do this, the dough is pretty wet and I add some flour, but this dough is pretty dry. I don't need to do that in this case. Getting it in the machine and then gradually I will also do the other pieces and move them through making the, the space of the pasta machine make that a little narrower so the dough gets a little thinner. To set the dough pieces out, I like to spread some flour in it so they don't stick. Here's this attachment for, I think it's, what is it? Fettuccine, linguine? That's my favorite one. I am attaching that to my pasta machine. And now here I have these really long pieces of dough. I always love that because then you get these long pieces of linguine and I am moving them through here so that I get the shapes cut out. You can't really see it on the other side. There was no room for the camera, unfortunately, because it's so pretty to come, come see how the dough comes out of the machine here in these long strands called fettuccine, or is it linguine? I don't know. You can leave a comment below and let me know what that is. And to keep them from sticking to one another, I'm just adding some flour here, dust the pasta shapes a little bit and mix it a little bit up and I'm gonna finish the rest of the pasta dough. I have a piece of meat that is venison. Our friends Jenny and Elliot caught this locally and gave it to us such a good awesome treat. I've never made venison before. It is very lean and that is why I'm adding some oil to the top, some salt and fresh ground pepper. They gave us instructions on how to cook it and I'm gonna put it in a glass baking dish that I also greased here. And then I'm gonna roast it at 450, I actually turned it up a little bit, for 12 
minutes and I want to see what the temperature is and what it looks like after 12 minutes. I decide to leave it in there longer and then turn it down to 350 to finish it. Meanwhile, I boiled my pasta and homemade pasta always cooks in just minutes, which is really nice. It takes longer to make it, but it cooks really fast. Giving that a quick rinse with some hot water to stop it from cooking and adding some butter to the pasta. Checking on my venison roast here. We're looking for an internal temperature of 125 to maybe 135, depending on how rare or done you like it. Since the oven is hot, I'm gonna bake my bread here. And here it is, it looks fantastic to plate it up. I am actually cutting it in slices with a steak knife. Of course, the outside is always a little bit more done than the inside, but it's just perfect. It's slightly pink on the inside, and this is a young animal, and it's very tender. You don't want to overcook it because it just gets tough. Here is the beet pasta. We are ready to eat. I am putting that on plates. And I always love adding some fresh goat cheese. First of all, it's a stunning color combination, the white goat cheese and the red beet pasta, but also the saltiness is a really nice taste contrast for the sweet earthy flavor. We're ready to sit down and I'm lighting my candles. Here they are, they burn just perfectly and I always love that scent of the beeswax. My husband already sat down. He unfortunately had hurt his back that day, so he wasn't in the cheeriest of moods. Can I just say that? <laughs> but he was being a good sport here. And sitting upright in a chair was not very comfortable for him. I am very excited to try local venison that our friends were so nice to share with us. That is our date night dinner and it took a little bit to cook but it was so enjoyable. If you enjoyed this video it would really mean a lot to me if you hit the like and the subscribe button if you're new here on my channel thank you so much for following along and i look forward to seeing you in the next video